Hey everyone, it's Andy. We're changing things up a bit and giving you a listen to another great podcast from Notre Dame. It's called With a Side of Knowledge, and I'll bet many of you are already subscribers. If you're not, you're in for a treat. My colleague, Ted Fox, interviews scholars from all over the spectrum and all over the world. I'll leave it to him to fill in the details as we share his latest episode featuring guest Fred Higgs, Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at Rice University. I'll be back to close out the show, but for now, take it away, Ted. From the University of Notre Dame, this is With a Side of Knowledge. I'm your host, Ted Fox. Before the pandemic, we were the show that invited scholars, makers, and professionals out to brunch for informal conversations about their work. And we look forward to being that show again one day. But for now... We're recording remotely to maintain physical distancing. If you like what you hear, you can leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Thanks for stopping by. Fred Higgs is John and Ann Dorr Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Rice University, where he is also Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Director of the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership. A past winner of a National Science Foundation Career Young Investigator Award, and a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Fred is the founder and director of the Particle Flow and Tribology Lab at Rice. I would try to define what tribology is, but I kind of got it wrong in the interview, and there's no need to embarrass myself twice. The good news is Fred is awesome at explaining things in terms even a non-engineer like me can understand. Back in March, I had the opportunity to watch him give an Edison lecture hosted by Notre Dame's College of Engineering and held virtually, of course, about some of the research they do in his lab in the area of additive manufacturing, or 3D printing. Here, we talked about how 3D printing actually works, some real-world applications that illustrate why you do it in the first place, and whether we'll ever be able to print three-dimensional objects as easily as we use a Xerox machine. Before that, though, we spent some time on the rise of intelligent machines and the ensuing paradigm shift for engineers looking to bring products to market. It's a great example of why Fred and others see ethics as a core component of engineering education. Fred Higgs, welcome to With a Side of Knowledge. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Ted. Thanks for inviting me. So the Edison lecture that you recently delivered to Notre Dame's College of Engineering, which was the, the first opportunity I had to learn a little bit about your work, Um, It was titled Industry 4.0 Design for Additive Manufacturing in Energy and Bioengineering Systems. And I wanted to start by asking you about two of the terms used there. What do we mean when when we talk about Industry 4.0 and maybe even before that? What are industries one, two, and three that led up to Industry 4.0? Oh, that's that's, that's a great question. Um, So I'll just kind of jump right into the industry part. Um, industry 1.0 or 2.0 or Industry X is essentially talking about the Industrial Revolution. So the first Industrial Revolution was we went from kind of an agrarian society uh, worldwide to one that was mechanized with uh, steam-powered uh, and water-powered uh, engines are there. And so now things move faster because you had a single machine. Well, in Industrial 2.0, you kind of assembled the machines together in a, assembly lines, and now you have like the Model T assembly line to make a uh, an automobile. In Industry 3.0, you started having a, a softwares that could control these machines, and so you were able to optimize a little bit better uh, and make uh, production a little more automated uh, than just kind of single machine uh, controls. But now in Industry 4.0, which we're in now and progressively moving into, uh, the machines themselves can have sensors on them so they can sense their environment. You also have the cloud, which is uh, kind of a a data repository somewhere else where you can send data to that. And if you have an algorithm on the cloud that tells that data what to do, you can send it back to those machines which from industry 3.0 were already controllable by data, but you could, but now they have sensors and ports to take internet-based data. They can take that data back and react to things. So 
now all of a sudden you have a machine that's intelligent, that can sense its environment and react to things based off of what happens to it. So, for example, in Industry 4.0, you might think of a coffee maker that has a sensor on it. And all the coffee makers that are in Houston or in South Bend, uh, Indiana, that are this particular type are taking in data. And they're seeing that, wait a minute, nobody's using our coffee maker outside of 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. So let's go into energy saving mode and shut it and shut all of them down uh, at that uh, time there. So because it sits what's going on with this environment and the data is coming out, you can make a decision in the cloud, uh, usually through an algorithm, right, uh, automatically, and send that back. And now the machines are are smarter there. So all of a sudden, the machines become distinct entities that can sense their environment and a brain outside of themselves uh, somewhere in the cloud can tell them how to make a better decision in the way in which you're being used. That is Industry 4.0. So it's the merger of the the physical and the digital systems, uh, often through uh, cyber connections. And is is it... The, this one and the same are similar to what we're talking about when we talk about the Internet of Things. Basically, the, these these physical machines that are they're no longer just physical things that we act on, but they can actually um, make decisions or optimize themselves. Yes, um, that's a that's a very good point. Um, the Internet of Things is certainly a large uh, part of this because you're right. The Internet of Things are basically saying that the Internet is made of these things that have they have a distinct identity on the internet. So like a sensor that sits there. And this would be, say, if you've gone to a Home Depot's or Lowe's, you see these kind of expensive smart bulbs. And it seems ridiculous, but wait a minute. So that single bulb has an IP address that I could access? Uh, (laughs) Oh, so now my phone could access it and turn it on and off. That's ridiculous inside Lowe's. That's really brilliant when you're laying on the bed and don't want to get up to turn off the light <laughs> on there. But you're right. So it's these things that are on the internet. Industry 4.0 is, is that, but it's a bit broader because you're thinking of uh, the entire way in which people uh, work and live and how products are produced and consumed. So you think of like a, a factory that has these machines and there are things that are on the internet But then with that paradigm shift in how these machines are connected, how they can sense and how they can make uh, decisions uh, through their data, what way should you change things? So, for example, uh, you know, I lead the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership. And, you know, it's about creating, producing leaders of engineering and technology. In other words, leaders that can lead other teams of engineers. Right now, the paradigm under which I've been trained as an engineer is that we optimize to try to get the product performing really well through models and things like that. And then once it's at its best, now you deploy it. You deploy a nice, robust, long-lasting technology. But in the industry 4.0 period, if that product can sense in the field wait a minute, there's a lot of things I can learn from the customer and their use of that product. So why am I rushing to put that product out? I'm sorry, why am I taking my time to put that product out there? I need to get it out there fast. As a matter of fact, I need to get the minimum viable product that we can make, get it out there fast. We learn from the data. All of us engineers are sitting in the room learning. Uh, The marketing people can, can learn from the data that's coming right from them. And then we iterate, improve that, and then we deliver the next one. The other way you can look at it is Tesla had a machine that you purchased on day one uh, several years ago. And then on day 1000, you got a note saying, bing, your car is now uh, autonomous. Wait, what? I didn't buy an autonomous vehicle. <laughs> yeah, it's autonomous now. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? I didn't drive it anywhere. I didn't, what do you mean? Right. They made the machine to have more functionality than you could currently use as a customer when they sold it to you. But it was interacting 
with a processor in the cloud somewhere. And so it learned from that data and they were somewhere in a research lab developing new technology. And since the engine can be controlled by data, it just got new data saying, look, here's a new algorithm. This is how you can react to things. So why, why do I mention that it makes a mechanical engineer uh, a little scary? Because it suggests that uh, number one, software is potentially eating the world. Um, software in the cloud is potentially eating the world because now they just come to me as a mechanical engineer once and they say, hey, we need an engine and we need to be able to vary it at any speed, vary the gas levels, make everything as variable as possible. And then put, we're going to put a control system on it. And I'm saying, wait, but you're going to come back to me for the next generation? No, we won't. If this thing could do everything, it's just going to, we're going to learn from it. And the data is going to uh, create uh, new algorithms. And then we're going to upload that back to the machine. We don't need you for a long while. <laughs> and that's, well, and, that's the potential. And I was, I was going to ask this, and I, and I still want to get it to um, additive manufacturing, what that is. But I was going to ask this in the context of that. But it, it seems appropriate here of... I imagine there's a lot of ethical questions that, I mean, you're talking about job security for a mechanical engineer, but there's also kind of that ethical piece of where do we need the human beings involved and how much, how much control should we cede over to the machines? I mean, is that kind of a, a moving target an ongoing conversation about where, where that line is? Uh, that, that's a great point. In the uh, Rice Center for Engineering Leadership, uh, we talk about looking at uh, ethics as a constraint on design technical, ethical uh, education. So uh, effectively, you can design a, a system, but you have to think, okay, one of my constraints is the weight ratio or the, the thrust to weight ratio. Say I'm doing something that's going to go to, to space. But also ethics is a, uh, a constraint. It must not give off this much greenhouse gas emissions. We want engineers to start to think, during the design process, where does ethics come into play? Now, one of the things about all this data coming back is that uh, you're not going to be able to interpret it. So that coffee machine that's giving you all this data, if you have a million customers using it across the United States uh, in different ways, a human doesn't know what to do with that. And so you need to have smart, what I call interpreters of that data to tell you what's going on. That's what, why something like artificial intelligence, where it comes into play, because it can take this data, cluster it, um, depends on which type of uh, learning uh, you're looking at. And then all of a sudden, it can make uh, these wise decisions uh, there. In doing that, you're right, a human's not in the loop as, it's his, as we have historically been. And so as a result, it may say, hey, optimizing means uh, the hood. That's what, you know, what I'm calling uh, a, a, a depressed socioeconomic environment. Um, the hood is not making any money off of these machines. So let's have not so great performance in a certain uh, a part uh, because this we're, we're not seeing their usage as good for this particular product. And so all of a sudden that particular neighborhood stops buying. It's made an unethical decision, the algorithm right. that created a, a racial uh, bias there. So we're talking a lot about this. I just had a meeting yesterday with uh, one of my colleagues here at Rice, uh, Professor Moshe Vardy in computer science. And uh, he, with the, along with another uh, postdoc who's kind of an ethicist, uh, created a course in the computer science department. And it looks at designing these problems that inherently uh, can spiral in an unethical uh, direction. And, and they're challenging the computer scientists to look and go, wait a minute, this is bad. So how can I modify the algorithms so that's not possible? So we're really thinking a lot about uh, the, the integration of ethics um, in engineering, having good te uh, technical, ethical thinking. Uh, and we want our engineers to, uh, we want all engineers to come out uh, with ethics as a constraint on the products that they're trying to deploy. Right. I mentioned Industry 4.0 for additive manufacturing is saying additive manufacturing is 3d printing is that oversimplifying it or is that in is that accurate yeah and so that, that used to be a big debate but in today's uh <laughs> uh yeah they're pretty synonymous so you may as well say uh, 3d printing yes i think 
we all, anyone listening to this, we probably have a vague image in our heads of what 3D printing is. There's a machine, an operator inputs some sort of data, and rather than something printed on a piece of paper that comes out, out comes an actual three-dimensional object. But, and I, I'm laughing as I say this because clearly I am not an engineer, but can you tell us a little bit about how that three-dimensional object actually gets made? And my understanding from your talk is that it, has to do with an area of science known as tribology. So tribology is actually my expertise. So it's not, it's it's present as one of the phenomenological actions within the 3D printing process, but it's not uh, essential to it. So you first okay. asked the question about the about 3D printing uh, being pretty phenomenal with additive manufacturing. Uh, I just said that yeah, effectively, yes, because there are other things you can do to manufacture things by, it's all about the difference in subtractive manufacturing versus additive. Most of the things when you and I were growing up were, are made off of a subtractive manufacturing. You have a big block of something and you cut it back until you get to the okay. final object. Well, you can imagine that has some design constraints, say the the interstitial uh, cavities within inside of a three-dimensional block that you're cutting away from. You know, you and I are made of... of of, you know, certain types of, of material, of biological material, but within us, there are little tubes and veins that fluids go through. How do you do that? Now, if you think in principle, and there are bio 3D printers, and we have uh, people that work on whole organ 3D printing is like the holy grail in the bio 3D printing world. But imagine that in principle, if you don't do subtractive, you do additive, you start from the bottom up and add things layer by layer. And it might be good here if I, if I go into the uh, definition of additive manufacturing. So you have a three-dimensional computer-aided design file of something that you are trying to print, CAD. The acronym is CAD. So you have a three-dimensional CAD file. It, it, it shows you Fred Higgs as a three-dimensional rendered object. Well, now you can feed that object to a 3D printer program and depends on how it is, they all have the same basic functionality. They spread a layer, and the ones, the, the 3D printers I work with are powder-based 3D printers. They spread a layer of something like powder, and then they look at the CAD drawing and see, we're at the bottom, right? Where are his feet? Okay, there's size 13. Let's solidify the powder in this area. And, and so they make a, a thin layer that shows the imprint of the bottom of my feet. And then the next layer goes up. Now it's a little bit of, you know, uh, a percent, small percent of my shoe. And then it goes up, or I should say, let's stick with my body. It's the next layer of my foot. And it just goes up in slices. If you do that, there's no reason you can't have holes in the middle of it and make little tubular geometries um, inside of it, little veins and things like that. Assuming that you had a printer that could do biological material, right? It's, there's just no reason why you could. So you could come up. And there's no uh, limitation to the design complexity because it's additive. But you cannot get me uh, uh, from a single block unless you just dealt with the exterior of me, like a sculpture, right? right? They could just right. come back a, a block, but the inside is the block, right? The inside will not be a bunch of tubes and, and cavities that are uh, that you're comprised of. You can only do that additive. So additive means you bring in a CAD model of something and the machine goes layer by layer and it's doing the same process it's uh, it's going layer by layer and then it puts it all together or at the end it's all together and you have a sub solid object I and mean, when you talk about a CAD file being the basis for that 3d printed object and I think I remember you saying this during the talk that we're still still a ways away from the idea that it would ever be as simple as something like a Xerox machine where anyone could go up and be like oh okay I want this this object is that something that is being worked toward or is it the kind of thing where it would always make sense that you know you're going to need a, a CAD file in order to produce this three-dimensional object well, that that is that's awesome so I do believe that we will get to the point where there will be like a, a Xerox or a Canon uh machine now if you come to my lab we have a metal 3d printer uh, it's a binder jet 3d printer and it looks like your Xerox machine. It looks like a Canon machine. So people get that impression that, wow, I see you pushing buttons. I see things coming out. This is it. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> this is it. exactly well. It's a powder bed three D printer. We're powder mechanics experts, so spreading. So when you bring it on new material and you want to spread it, it needs to be pretty smooth and uniform. We got a PhD that's worked on that, <laughs> and that PhD has produced <laughs> models, and that model has become a. a we have a software called uh, Spreadify, and that software can take. You, it, you can put it in a, uh, a what's called a powderometer, a little sample of your powder. It characterizes the powder to get its properties, its spreading properties. Based off of that, it generates some settings to know under what spreading parameters, like the speed at which you spread, the, the weight that's on the roller per se, um, the spinning rate of the roller, all these things in spreading it, it will tell you what they need to be set to for that printer uh, to get a nice uniform spread layer for that particular powder material. That right there was a PhD that worked on that. Right. And there's another PhD right. following uh, that right. up. But that tool, uh, Spreadify, literally a licensable tool, that tool, if a company were, say, the license had to put on their printer, it's one step towards making that automatic. That's just one of the processes in the 3D printer. There are others that if you have a laser fusion or electron beam a melting uh, or centering uh, type of uh, system, they bring in, you have to bind the powders now. My printer uses a liquid binder, like a glue. Wherever it goes down, it makes it solid where the CAD drawing says it should be solid. So other printers that are like the fusion-based ones, laser or electron beam, I call them beam-based, laser beam or electron beam, they come down, hit an energy source on the powder, and there it becomes solidified. But the point is that both of them look to solidify the powder on a particular slice, and they move up. There are PhD students that are just trying to come up with predictive ways for different powders, looking at the, the beam uh, energy, looking at the uh, translation velocity of the beam as it's trying to solidify different parts. There are PhDs that, that are just doing that. I have a PhD that looks just at the fluid, from a binder jet going down, I showed this in the uh, Notre Dame seminar. The fluid goes down into the powder and it pulls the particles together to form, to form a solidified uh, primitive, we call it. There's a PhD that's working on that day and night, right? Um, and getting that model to work and then validate that with experiments, we now say, we, we would then say, ah, now we have a model. Then a company could come in, license that. And it's another process that has become a little bit more predictable. You get a bunch of models like that to guide the printers in what to do. You're getting closer to the uh, conventional two-dimensional copy machines that we have from Xerox right now. Those machines have already been optimized. They know, but we got five inks, you know, we're color. We, we, we understand the speed at which we do this. The settings aren't changing anymore. And so they're locked in. All of us are, you are working with PhD students to create these models to tell the machines what to do. And that's just from the, the additive process that's on. But the beautiful thing is that, remember, it started with a digital file and then right. and, and is driven by uh, the data that's coming in from that file. So in principle, if that machine were sensing things, that machine is guided by digital data. And that's what, the, uh, that's what Industry 4.0 is all about. That's why it's one of the key technologies that are on that, because you can, from data, you get three-dimensional objects that you and I could drive or fly in or sleep on, right? And, and that's a new paradigm shift, because now you can produce things without actually having any human intervention in principle. If you have a factory that's a, a full Industry 4.0 factory, you, you may not have to have in, uh, human intervention for a lot of uh, parts there. So, and this was something that you did hit on. What are uh, some of the the practical applications you all are working on right now? I, I know you talked about something called drillology a little yeah. bit, some hip implants. It seemed like there were some really cool things that you're already doing in, in looking at how additive manufacturing, 3D printing um, might be able to better serve some of the needs of the world right now. Once you realize that a CAD, which you can make a CAD file of any geometry. Before 3D printer came out, they had CAD. If you could give that to the printer, 
and then the printer can print whatever that is. And it, it can do it at the same speed as maybe a little slower, depending on the complexity, but it can do it at a really fast speed. All of a sudden, you start going, wait a minute, why am I mass manufacturing everything? Because mass manufacturing from industry 2.0 was about making the same Model T's. So wait a minute, right. Fred is 6'4", Ted is, what's your height, Ted? Six feet. Okay, that's not bad. So, <laughs> so wait a minute, Fred wants an SUV that is suited just for him. So we can make that one, and then Ted can have one that's suited for him, no wasted room. Why are we doing mass manufacturing? We need to do mass customization because it's mm. that's a tweak to the cat file, which can happen automatically. So the whole point is that things become personalized. And so what yeah. we're doing with it is we're looking at personalized manufacturing, and it has different definitions for different industries. So if you're talking about um, geothermal, you know, clean geothermal uh, energy out there, then you talk about a special type of uh, drill bit, and we say that we can personalize your drill bit to your geothermal rock that you have to drill. The rock's going to have different lithology, different uh, geomechanical properties there, and we will run some analysis on that rock, and then the, you know, in our case, you talk about drillogy. We we made a code that actually runs through those properties of the rock, and then says. This is what your drill bit needs to do to have a good drilling rate. And it gives it auto, it modifies the bit getting CAD design. So now the winning CAD design is sent to the 3D printer. And now you make that particular uh, drill bit. That's a, So that's a rock specific drill bit. It's personalized for that rock. Now you talk about my father's artificial knee, right? My father got you know an artificial knee several years ago one size fits many. I'm not going to say it's one size fits all. It's one size fits many. <laughs> but, you know, right. my father is, um, you know, about uh, 80. And he's, or, you know, just uh, surpassed 80. And, you know, he takes walks in the neighborhood and things like that. You know, he has this weight. He walks a certain way. Um, there he has a certain gait motion. And all those variables can be taken into account to give him a custom knee. If all things being equal in the manufacturing process, then let's make one for my father. So it's a personalized need that we're after. Uh, the project we, we, that I showed at, at the Notre Dame uh, Edison lecture was for a personalized hip joint um, there because we're working with a, uh, a professor here at Rice, B.J. Frankly, who's, uh, who has a cancer project with our state. And it's with MD Anderson, one of the uh, world-class uh, cancer centers everything there becomes personalized, right? Because cancer affects people in different ways. So you have, once you bring on, say, an implant, like a hip, you know, pelvic implant, and the hip part is custom to a different patient because the cancer affected them in different ways. Otherwise, if you treat them all, they're like three regions on the pelvis, and depends on how much, you know, bone has been affected, you have to cut bones. And so you... You're very conservative. But if you could be custom, like, ah, no, 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 no. Forget the type one, type two, type three cut. What do we do if, you know, God forbid, a Fred Higgs uh, cut? And there we just say, ah, here's the minimum that's needed. We've done the analysis on this guy. And we can do one that's personalized for him. Well, you can do that. And now you don't have to go and say, hey, can y'all build a new expensive mold at the manufacturer for it? It's a 3D printer. You just say, hey. We've altered the CAD for this guy and now print him a custom hip joint. And our, we have models that for each project have the different uh, modes of physics that governs the performance of that particular product you're trying to build. And we take that performance into account to do this analysis. We get a winning candidate and then we print it out. So the pattern is, is constantly that, whether it's a drill bit or it's a you know, an uh, orthopedic implant, whether it's a hip or a knee like what my father has, it comes down to g getting patient-specific information, running some analysis um, that shows you which winning design is personalized for that patient. And now you can do it for a lot of people. You have mass customization, not mass manufacturing. Right. That's very cool. Um, 
just as we're we're wrapping up here, we've we've mentioned Rice and our provost here at Notre Dame, Mari Lynn Miranda. She used to be provost at Rice and worked with you. And as I told you, she was very excited when she found out I was going to talk to you. And you've already mentioned it. She said to make sure that I asked specifically about the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership, which you direct. And you've told us uh, it, it's come up at a couple different points. But what is the what is kind of the mission and the purpose of that center? What are you looking uh, to instill in your engineers while you have them with you at the university level before they go out and and start practicing that practicing engineering in the world? That's, that's a great point. Uh, and it is all about them practicing engineering in the you know, real world beyond our uh, ivory towers. Um, so in a nutshell, it is to produce uh, ethical leaders in technology and engineering. And that would be the concise statement. But the way in which we do that is kind of two-pronged. We have arguably the most professors in the practice uh, on uh, in a single unit uh, on campus uh, there, you know, so like a department uh, level unit. Uh, we have a lot of professors in the practice and pretty much all of them were executives in industry. And so we bring them back, you know, some of them have you know, PhDs in engineering and the MBA, some of us have PhDs in engineering uh, and some have, you know, engineering degree and, and uh, maybe an MBA. Uh, there, but they all reached the pinnacle at, at different corporations, and now they come back with that perspective. They put their industry lens on teaching and advising our students. But it's within a vision, and that vision is that you're going to get fundamental engineering uh, leadership training. And those are courses like uh, those th- teaching the basic core competencies of uh, communications, having vision. Uh, teamwork, followership, their uh, ethics and values, being able to to, to think quickly uh, on your feet. But all those core fundamental engineering leadership skills is one prong. The second prong is you must choose a career track under the acronym RIPE, right? So these students are pursuing this undergraduate engineering leadership certificate. And at the end, they must choose from the acronym RIPE RIPE stands for Research Industry, the P is a non-engineering pathway, and the E is for entrepreneurship. So they choose to take a class to apply the engineering leadership fundamental principles that I just talked about to one of those career tracks. So a young Fred Higgs, me 20 years ago, when I came out of a, a school, I would, actually 25 years ago, when I came out of school, uh, who's counting <laughs> That's right. I don't like to come, <laughs> exactly. I like to come back either. <laughs> exactly. So when I came out of school, I I would have obviously be an R student, right? I was going on to pursue my PhD and to build a research right. career. I would have chosen the R track. Uh, a lot of students choose the I track, which a lot of our professors in the practice say that towards because they're going towards industry. I'll come back to the P. The last one is entrepreneurship. Uh, there are students who you want to go on and be the next uh, job. Bezos or, you know, uh, get into understanding this like a venture capitalist like uh, John Doerr and you know, a lot of other famous engineering, uh, innovative business people, Elon Musk, you know, engineers that go on to start companies, they would choose the E-track, the entrepreneurship track. Right. But then that P is, is a little non-traditional. We recognize that people uh, in, this, in the later generation, because of social media, these students come in way more informed. So, uh, you know, I was talking with an undergrad and I said, hey, uh, what do you want to do? And they said, I'm going to med school. So no, I mean, when you're finished, you're going to work in the industry. Do you want to go to med school? No, I'm going to med school right after undergrad. What? You're never going to work in the gym? No, I was just using it as an enabling pathway because they know that engineering is a really good way to get into business school, law school, and med school. So they could just choose that pathway and then go on into, you know, one of those professional programs. If they stop short, they still have an engineering degree. They're not coming to sophisticated and choosing that with no plans to ever work other than an internship uh, in engineering. So we call that the non-engineering pathway. And we have a an instructor, George Webb, who has two degrees in engineering, uh, you know, electrical degrees, a bachelor's and a master's, and then he went to law school to become a patent attorney. And then we were able to bring him back, and now he teaches these students, hey, there's some non-engineering pathways that your engineering is good for. You, we want analytical, objective-minded people Running for president, 
And so we want to engage these students who have that passion to work outside of engineering. It, just you saying that there at the end reminded me I had um, Trish Culligan, the dean of our uh, College of Engineering, on a few episodes ago, and she talked about just needing more people in policy who were engineers and who had an engineering background to, you know, understand the things that they're making decisions about and how much how much more needed that is. And it, and it happens in other countries and we need more people like that running for office in the U.S. Yes, so indeed, um, indeed. And so there's an undergraduate engineering leadership certificate um, that focus on fundamental engineering leadership, and then you have to choose to apply it to one of those four uh, career directions. Fred Higgs, this is this has been really great. I, I I do feel like I have a better understanding of some of these things now, so I really appreciate you taking the time to to talk with us today. Ted, I, I appreciate this opportunity, and uh, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to hearing great things from the other parts of your podcast. With a Side of Knowledge is a production of the Office of the Provost at the University of Notre Dame. Our website is with a side of pod.nd.edu. Well, we hope you enjoyed us sharing an episode of With a Side of Knowledge. If you like what you heard and haven't already done so, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Now, we're still planning two more episodes of Notre Dame Stories to finish out the year. Be looking for them, and we thank you for listening during what's been a challenging production year. Notre Dame Stories is produced by the Office of Public Affairs and Communications. I'm your host, Andy Fuller. Our music is by Alex Mansour.